what we pay attention to literally defines what we will experience in our world, in our reality. That's how our brains work, and that's what modern neuroscience has figured out with a quantum biologist, etc. That literally, we are we are a, like a search engine, and when it comes to processing our data, and the data that we search for to bring into our reality is based on what we pay attention to. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Rebel Brown, who's going to help us how to pay attention. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions inner interact with other listeners. Today's quote is from Eckhart Tolle. Memories are thoughts that arise. They are not realities. Only when you believe that they are real, then they have the power over you. But when you realize it's just another thought arising about the past, then you can have a spacious relationship with that thought. The thought no longer has you in its grips. Our thoughts and emotions trap us. Our attention towards a negative experience sets an emotion in our subconscious to prove that right. The opposite is also true. Let's start questioning ourselves. And we're going to dig into that today. Before we do, let's get to last week's action step. Balance your checkbook. Seriously, if you're not doing this once to twice a month, your money is going to disappear because you haven't paid any attention to it. You'll forget that things are automatically being charged to you that you forgot about. You won't notice how your money is flowing and what you ignore is going to come back to bite you. Money equals freedom to live the life of your dreams. It's your choice. Steer your life or live in the drift. I prefer not to play life as a lottery. I want to do my best to know I have the winning numbers. We've lived through some amazing times, and I know a lot of people look around, we see COVID, unemployment, and a lot of trouble in our world. But then I think back and I realize my 18-year-old just signed up for selective service. But he doesn't even know what that is. He has no fear of being drafted and sent to Vietnam. Nobody's bombing us. Slavery is essentially gone. Openly being discriminatory is shunned. Most people realize smoking is bad. The average American is living in the top 1% of the world. We're improving, even though sometimes it feels like the world is getting worse. The key to a wonderful day is to awaken with gratitude. It changes what you look for in life. And we're going to dig into that topic today. While we're speaking of money, 
One of the upcoming threats that we have to face is financial repression. This is where the government borrows money at below market rates to pay off the massive debt they just created. That's going to take us decades to pay off. The result is that inflation will be higher than how much you earn on your savings. Over time, you lose purchasing power and your money doesn't grow as fast as it needs to to keep up. We don't need negative interest rates for this to happen. We just need a gap between interest rates paid and the inflation rate, with inflation being higher than what we're earning. The Fed has already released policy change statements that will allow for this. On top of the crazy political behavior on both sides of the aisles from our politicians, I really want to understand the markets better so we can navigate them well. I'm going to see if I can find a guest on this very topic. Today, we have Rebel Bat Brown back again to share her wisdom. You can check out her backstory in episode 130, where she shares how we are designed to be powerful. Today, she's back to talk about attention. Let me just give you a little reminder of who she is and what she's done. From disruptive startups to companies seeking expansive growth, to billion-dollar turnarounds, Rebel navigates chaos to find strategic advantages in any economy or situation. Chaos is comfortable for Rebel. She knows how to navigate and leverage to find the hidden in plain sight, breakthroughs that redefine your status quo, all with a double dose of fun and a straight-up shot of reality. Get ready for anything but a one-size-fits-all approach. Rebel's background is unique, to say the least. Her business experience ranges from the complexity of high-tech and biosciences to multi-level marketing companies to nonprofits. Her personal adventures are taking her from a minor in philosophy to deep studies in ancient texts, esoteric practices, and hidden knowledge beyond modern science. Expect anything but a traditional consultant, speaker, or coach. Let's meet Rebel and hear what she has to share. Welcome to Richer Soul, Rebel Brown. It's great to have you back again to join us today. It's great to be back, Rocky, because you know how much I love you. <laughs> and I'm excited for the conversation because this is something I have trouble with all the time which is I look up and I go, how did I get here? How did that happen? What did I miss? And that is because we all are so attention distracted these days. And we're just going to roll right into this is, first of all, let's define the problem. Why is attention so important? So, you know, Rocky, we've all been taught to pay attention. Right. I remember I don't know about you, but I remember vividly when my teacher would say, pay attention. Right. And I also remember getting smacked on the hand with a ruler a couple of times. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. Right. But, you know, we are taught from the time we're tiny to pay attention. Right. You pay attention to the road. You pay attention to crossing the street. You pay attention to your parents. You pay attention to your teachers. You pay attention. You pay attention. You pay attention. You pay attention right. What we aren't taught is that what we pay attention to literally defines what we will experience in our world, in our reality. That's how our brains work, and that's what modern neuroscience has figured out with a quantum biologist, et cetera, that literally we are, we are a, like a search engine when it comes to processing our data, and the data that we search for to bring into our reality is based on what we pay attention to. And that was a big awakening for me because, you know, we all talk about, you know, you've all heard, we all hear about law of attraction and all that stuff. But, you know, it is it's true. What we pay attention to is what our unconscious minds and our conscious minds believe we want in our reality. Now, here's the twist. As we're taught, I want you to think back to when you were taught to pay attention. Are you taught to pay attention to all the wonderful, great things that happen in your life? Or are you taught to or? Are you taught to pay attention to the mistakes, the problems, the threats, the potential threats, the potential, potential threats that wake you up at two in the morning, right? 
we weren't taught the power of our attention and we were taught to pay attention to the negative and the potential negative. And that sets us up to create less than we want in our lives. And these self-fulfilling prophecies of these same problems over and over again, or same fears or same threats, because that's what we're paying attention to. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And the way I've heard this explained before, and most people have experienced this, you know, you decide you want to buy a new car. And you decide you want to buy whatever it is, maybe a new Mercedes. All of a sudden, everywhere you look, there's new Mercedes, right? You see these Mercedes on the street. They were always there. You just never paid attention to them before. Your mind never even showed them to you. But now that you're interested in it, all of a sudden, they show up everywhere you're going. And you see them everywhere. And so that's basically what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. And science, here's the thing. Our brains... Were designed, you know, we were our brains were designed back in caveman times, right? I mean, let's let's face it. Have we evolved? Absolutely, but the design was still built, right? And the design was that our unconscious mind would take in our data and literally filter it, just like a search engine, and seek within that data for what it wanted to present as our reality to our conscious minds, and then our conscious minds would act on that reality. Well, here's the thing. Our conscious minds can only process 57 bits of information a second. That is like the floppy drive desktop I sold when I first started in business in 1979, right? That's how slow that is. The problem is in modern day, we take in 11 million bits of data a second. And we have to Think of that as your search parameter. And now as a search engine, we're searching through that 11 million bits to pick. We actually pick 127 and that goes to our conscious mind. And then our conscious mind picks only 57 of that 127. Now, if you want to put that in a relative framework, imagine you took toothpicks boxes and you piled them a mile high. That would be your data, a mile high of toothpick boxes which each toothpick as a bit of data. You select one box out of that mile high of toothpick boxes, and that becomes your reality that you experience every second. Now, imagine how many other realities are sitting in those toothpick boxes that get ignored because you haven't paid attention to anything related to them, so your mind doesn't believe you want anything to do with that data. That's what got me hooked on this, Rocky. It's quantum theory, right? It's many worlds of quantum theory. In 11 million bits of data, if I only pick 127, that is 0.00001%. How many other options are there in there that I don't see? Because literally my unconscious mind goes, Oh, that doesn't agree with what she's been paying attention to, so I'm going to delete it. So if I'm paying attention to, oh, I don't know, not get to, you know, something horrific, or if I'm paying attention to the potential of a threat coming at me, right? Oh, my God, I'm going to lose my business. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose my business. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose my business. What that translates to is that my unconscious mind, my mind, is only going to pick data out of my reality that matches what I'm paying attention to, which is lose my business. Right? Is this why we shouldn't watch the news? This is what, well, this is, uh, you know what? I watch very little of it. We were talking about this before we started. I watch very little. I have really, really called back on Facebook, on news, on everything. Because if, if there was, you know, we select the data that becomes our reality based on our expectations and our beliefs. And those expectations and beliefs are created by what we pay attention to. Now, it's all it's all unconscious, right? The unconscious mind really processes all of this. But, you know, when by the way, we've all had this happen. No two of us sit in the same room and process the data the same way. So no two of us have the same reality, right? And because we're not paying attention to the same things. You know, if you, I'll tell you the favorite example I use is you're sitting and you've got two opposing teams and there's fans of both teams sitting in the room with you. 
And if you've ever listened to it, a referee makes a call and whoever the t- whichever team, let's say Team A gets the advantage of the call. The fans for Team A think it was the best call ever, and the fans for Team B think it was the worst call ever. And if you talk to both of them, it will be like they saw a completely different play. That is a tension at work. We see it the same way in our businesses. You get 10 people in a meeting. You ever had 10 people in a meeting, and when they leave and you go talk to them, they all have a different version of what was said in the meeting? All the time, right? It's because... We're paying attention and have paid attention to different things, which has set up these search filters in our minds that are looking for the things and the data that matches what we paid attention to. Pattern matches. So one person is going to match to one thing they hear in the meeting and contort it. Another's going to hear it another way. A third one's going to hear it another way. And then you wonder why everybody goes off and does something different. And you, and you think you had a really clear meeting, right? I know that's never happened to you, has it, Rocky? There's a reason I don't go to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we see it all the time, right? And, and by the way, what happens is, you know, if you get into the science of it, and, and uh, the science gets pretty complicated, but basically what happens is you create what I think of as little pearls. They're called gestalts. They're called metaprograms. They're called all kinds of things. But I think of them as little pearls, and that little pearl becomes a filter that says, oh, rebel believes... Rebels paid attention to the fact that she can't do X. So when my data comes in and I get an opportunity to actually be able to do X, I throw it away. I pick the data that proves what I've already believed. And every time I pick that data, I create another little pearl that strengthens it. So I create these self-propelling prophecies. And I wonder why I can never do X and nothing ever changes. And by the way, I focus on it. I grumble about it, right? When I'm washing the dishes, I grumble. I really want to do X, but I can't do X, right? We all do it. And now with modern science, we actually understand why and how it works and what we can do to change it, right? But in the meantime, the bottom line is we're taught to pay attention. We're taught to pay attention to the worst possible cases out there and and be prepared, right? We're not taught to pay attention to our successes, to the growth, to the wonderful things, to pat ourselves on the back. And what ends up happening is we end up building all these self-propelling prophecy programs that just keep repeating the things that we really don't want, but that we focus on because that's what we were trained to pay attention to. When we change our attention, we change what happens in our world and we literally start to control our experience. And it works. And, and you know it works because you've been there. We've, we've, been, we've talked about that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And more and more people understood. You know, I, was, I got fascinated when I learned all this. And, you know, if more people understood what, what the truth is about us, not the turn of this 19th century stuff that is all of ancient psychology. And I'm not saying it doesn't have value. I'm just saying there's scientific evidence and discoveries that have changed what that that have proven that that wasn't accurate. Our unconscious mind is not the dark evil side of us. It is actually the work the workhorse of our minds. It does the majority of the work and you know people don't know this but our unconscious mind makes 95% of our decisions and triggers 95% of our behaviors based on these program these self-fulfilling prophecies and these attentions and what we've created. Without our conscious mind ever knowing it, it just goes ahead and handles it, handles it so that our conscious mind only gets the reality and what we need to actually logically process. Your unconscious mind is constantly working for you. It is not the evil, dark thing that Freud and Jung and all those guys said it was. It's misunderstood, but it's actually a powerful force that we can all use when we understand how to use it. And attention is the simplest way to take control of it and teach it. Because what you pay attention to is what it thinks you want. And by the way, it doesn't hear a negative. I don't want that. I don't want this. All it hears is the focus of your attention. You're focused on losing your job, losing your business, losing your contract, failing, whatever, all the threat of, you know, coming down the path. That's what it thinks you want. It's not, it's not logical and processing. It's doing what you're telling it to do. And that's true. And that's why people can drive to work and forget the entire drive and not even notice that they're doing the drive. And I remember when we were kids, we didn't have the seatbelts like we have today. 
And so whenever a driver had a kid in the front seat and they would they would hit the brake, their arm would automatically go out to smack the kid in the chest to hold him from flying forward. Wear seatbelts. We try. They want, but I do that, right? And, and, and by the way, that brings up a really good point. We were going to talk about it a little bit later, but when you're driving, when you're doing rote tasks, right, uh, shaving, driving, putting on makeup for women, maybe guys, I don't know, um, washing dishes, doing laundry, you know, all those rote tasks. We're paying attention. We're just doing it unconsciously because what are you doing while you're driving down the street? Grousing about your boss or grousing about the weather or bitching about the traffic or thinking about what could potentially happen if if you take this and do that, and then so and so does this, then you could get really in trouble. You know, we're we're doing all that unconscious attention, and we don't know we're doing it, and that's where most of our programming comes from. And so, is that why we have such chaos in our minds in today's yeah. world? Yeah. Well, you know. You know, today's world is really interesting. To, well, it's interesting for many reasons, as you and I've talked about. Um, fear, the fear response, the threat response is controlled by the unconscious mind. All right. And the unconscious mind has two tasks. One is to, to manage your data, store everything, be efficient. And the other is to keep you safe. It is the fight, flight, freeze response, right? It, it is, that is its priority mechanism right there. So if you look in our world today, let's take before COVID and all of that. Let's go back before. All of the masses of data coming at us that, were, that are so diverse, right? And by the way, rapid fire threat, right? Even before COVID, rapid fire change, which is threat puts the unconscious mind into a constant state of threat response, which is fight, flight, or freeze, which we've all been taught, right? Well, it was designed to be put in that maybe once a week, because how often did a caveman drop into that, right? In our modern world, if you even pick up a newspaper or look online or read your email or whatever, there's threat everywhere, right? So we're in this hyper-stimulated state that, Literally, a different set of chemistry takes over, right? So fear hijacks our attention unconsciously, all right? Now, what it does is it, you know, when you're in a situation where you feel powerless, which I would say a lot of people feel that way right now, right? We're looking for ways to find control, safety, a way forward, etc. When we're in that situation, our mind starts to do anything it can to find a way to feel like it's in control. All right. So first of all, what happens is, you know, we've all heard about fight, flight and freeze, right? Well, with fight, what happens, you're going to drop into one of those three categories, you know, response categories, even, and that's going to impact what you're paying attention to unconsciously and somewhat consciously, Right. So, for example, you know, we look at the behaviors that are out there. Let's just look at some of the behaviors. You see the the raging, the attacks, the arguments, the just the nasty things. That's those are people in a fight response, right? And they're paying it. Their way to find control is to pay attention to how do I get control of my life? And in their particular case, it's a fight response. I'm going to attack everything. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to get out my gun. I'm going to do whatever, and I'm going to attack. Right. Then you see people that are in denial. Right. I'm going to deny everything. Nothing's going to happen to me. I, I'm just going to ignore it all. That's a flight response in a human. Right. So, you know, the conspiracy theories, the world's just fine, blah, blah, blah. You've got that. And then you've got the freeze, which is basically it's the most common, but it's the least visible, because basically what we do is we hunker down into the way we've always done it and thought about it. And we hang on to the status quo because that's where we were safe, right? And we just keep repeating what we're doing and praying it's going to change. And, 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 and trying to change, but still paying attention to the same darn stuff that got us in trouble in the first place, right? Because 
we've got this threat response going on. It's driving us to even look for more threats. It's driving us to search for what could go wrong. And the more we focus on what could go wrong, the more we build that into what we're going to experience. Now, I'll give you a little, here's, here's an example. It was really interesting. I recently judged the Arizona Biotech Awards. A friend of mine runs that, and she asked me to be a judge for the, comp- for the, tech, for the biotech companies. And there was a really interesting thing I noticed. So remember when we first started into COVID and there wasn't any PPE, right? Testing. The materials weren't there. Nothing was there. We couldn't stat. We couldn't get enough for the hospitals. We still don't have enough for the hospitals and the testing. Everybody was overwhelmed. The vendors that had traditionally done that froze, right? They couldn't make any more. They couldn't catch up. Well, in Arizona, there were these two companies that shifted their manufacturing in under two weeks from the products they were manufacturing that were in healthcare of the same materials, but different focus. In two weeks, they shifted everything over to to build PPE and lab materials because they didn't pay attention to the threat. They pay attention to how to solve the threat. They focused their attention on out-of-the-box thinking, and instead of saying, oh, we can't do that, or this is what we do, they said, wait a minute, here's an opportunity, this needs to be done, how do we do it? And they stepped out of the status quo, what they knew about themselves, and brainstormed to be different. And that's what we all have to learn how to do with our attention right now, right? They didn't allow the the threat response to drive them to the threat, they allowed the threat response to open their minds to be able to see other options, But that's not the natural way humans work. The natural way humans work is to narrow, narrow, narrow and hunker down and stay in what's safe and known, which is the way we've always done it. And I've noticed that a lot. For a lot of people, there were many people during COVID who just said there's nothing we can do and they hunkered down. And then there were other people, as you said, who pivoted, found ways and the people who pivoted in business, I've noticed, are thriving. Like they found ways to overcome a downturn in their business. And some of them are doing better now than before. Because they stepped out of the box. They stepped out of the box. They said, hey, we can do something. And they went for it. And if you go back to what they were focused on, Their attention wasn't focused on how they'd always done it. Their attention was focused on what can I do different? What can I do different? What can I do different? Right? Not, but you've got to consciously do that. And you also have to, you know, you have to consciously shift. And, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things you can do there. But you also have to pay attention to what you're unconsciously focused on. Because your unconscious mind will go off. and, And this is my favorite one. I catch myself all the time when I'm doing dishes, grousing about something. No, I don't know why it's doing dishes, but, and, and I don't know if you do this, but you know, like I'll have a conversation with a client and I'll just want to punch him because it's like, please just listen. And I'll get it as far as I can. And I know I'll get it farther, but you know, it takes time. And I'll be that night, I'll be washing dishes and I'll be having that conversation and I'll be saying what I really wanted to say. Right. And I'll be letting it all hang out. I know you've never done that, right? <laughs> we we all ruminate over the things that we but felt what, slighted about throughout the day. But I, well, here's why I laugh. What am I paying attention to when I'm grousing about that conversation? The problem. The problem. I'm not paying attention to, okay, that's what happened. Now, what are the three things I could do to move it forward? Right which I will get to eventually, but I'm wasting all of this time and building all these bat programs that literally press against me moving to the solution because I'm grousing. And that's an unconscious thing. It's that rote thing, driving down the road. What are you, ta- what are you thinking about going into work? Are you thinking about how oh, I'm going to walk in and kick their, you know, I'm, <laughs> I stopped myself, Rocky. I didn't say it. I'm going to walk in and kick him. I'm going to walk in and fight this guy. I'm going to tell this guy what I think of him or this is going to be happening. Are you right, driving down the road going, you know what? Today's going to be really great. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. That's not how, I mean, we'll do it if we're conscious. But if we're unconscious, we'll slide into the negative because that's how we've been trained. And we have to retrain that unconscious side as well as the conscious side. 
So how do people know where their focus is unconsciously? Like, where is their unconscious focus? You pay attention to what you're thinking about when you're not thinking. Doing the dishes. Walking along, taking a walk. Brushing your dog. Uh, riding the riding the train, driving to work, uh, you know, the rote tasks, because that's when your unconscious thinking is happening. And so, think, well, what, think, how do we how do we stop it or retrain it? Well, there's all kinds of lessons that we can do to stop it. The first thing here's here's what I do. All right. And here's what I have clients do. And then we can talk about more things to do. Right. But but basically what I will do is when I catch myself doing that, the first thing I do is stop. Then I laugh because what have we all been taught to do? We've been taught to beat ourselves up when we catch ourselves doing something negative or talking negative. Right. Well, all you do is imprint more beat. And when you're beating something up, you're still giving your unconscious mind a negative attention. Right. It's still negative. So what I do is when I can, like I'll give you an example, you know, um, I had a hard time figuring out how to bring this this business, this conversation into my business, which is turnarounds in high tech and biotech companies, you know, for for everything from early stage to turnarounds to product strategy, et cetera. And I kept telling myself, you haven't don't have silos. You don't have expertise in just one thing. You're broad and that's a bad thing. And I kept telling myself that over and over again. And then when I decided I wanted to bring this this mind work into it. I was like, well, that's a left turn. And everybody's like, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. And I would just sit and, and grouse with myself about, oh, it can't be, it can't be, I can't do this, I can't do this, I really want to do this, but I can't do this, and, and all the reasons why. And then one day, it really hit me. You know, I caught myself grousing about that as I was trying to brainstorm what I wanted to do with, with a certain speaking engagement. And this little voice pops up and says to me, I caught myself doing it. And I was like, you know what? Why do I believe that having a broad, diverse and deep experience from 30 years of consulting is a bad thing? Why do I believe that? And as soon as I asked myself that question, the answer was, well, it's not. Well, then why wouldn't I feature it? Okay, I will. And it was that quick, right? I got to that level of conscious change. So the first thing I do is first thing I do is I stop and I usually laugh at myself because that laughter lightens everything. And then I start asking myself, why am I talking about this? Why am I giving having this conversation with myself? Why do I believe this? And you know what? 99% of the time, the answer is, well, because that's what I was told or that's how I've always believed and it's not valid. And that, you know, I, I can't stand that word. That's the way we've always done it. Like that, that's the one that's going to set me off. <laughs> my first book, Defy Gravity, my key theme was the way we've always done it is the reason for the mess we're in. Mm. And especially in business, because I will tell you, I've done I, I've worked for over 300 client, you know, businesses and every single one of them, they didn't hire me because they were doing well. They hired me because they had problems. And every single one of them, I can tell you the reason they were in a mess was because they hunkered down on the way they'd always done it because they started having changes in their market and their competitors, whatever. And they held on to the status quo. This is the way we do it. And they paid attention to that and they locked onto that. And literally, they could have had, I would walk in, Rocky, I would walk in and in a day, I'd give them five new ideas and they'd think I was brilliant. Now, I might be smart, you know, I'm, but I'm not that brilliant. The reason I saw the ideas is because my attention was not limited by what they had always done. My attention was 360 degrees open to what they could be. So I could literally take in the data that I saw that they presented to me that showed me opportunities, whereas they could not see them as opportunities because literally their attention was focused on, this is the way I've always done it. So the only data I'm going to see and be able to process is what matches that. And that's why when I coach people, I see so many opportunities right in front of them. And and half the time they're like, oh yeah, I should have thought of that. I don't know why I didn't. (laughs) But, you know, I'll have, you know, I, I'll have be, I, I had a venture capitalist one time tell me that, you know, he'd made this, inve- they'd made this huge investment in this really cool company, but that talking to the management, the exec team about the vision they had was like talking to a wall, right? They couldn't get through. 
Well, the wall is not the wall. It's not them being stubborn. It's because, okay, here you've got an exec team that's been together for a while and they've all locked in onto the same belief system, same attention. What do we do? What don't we do? Where do we win? Where don't we win? What do we never want to ever do because we failed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they've got this Kool Aid and they're all focused on it. And an opportunity, the, the, my venture guys are trying to show them opportunities, but they're showing them opportunities in a way that they can't see them because their minds immediately shove the data out and go, doesn't match, doesn't match, not true, not true, and throw it away. Because that, uh, that 11 million bits, we picked that 127. The rest of that 11 million bits, 10 million, what, nine, whatever, 800, 900, whatever, all get thrown away. They're deleted. So the VCs are going at them in a way that, that, that literally, as they're showing them, they're showing them the advanced vision of what they could do. I walk in and I find one hook for them to take a step from where they are to where the, where the vision is that matches into what they're already doing, but just stretches it a little bit and they can take it. Then you stretch them a little bit more. But the wall is in our minds and in the way, the way we process, not an emotional stubbornness. You know, I'll hear people go, oh, my God, they're so stubborn. They, they can't even listen to the facts I'm trying to tell them. It's not that they can't listen. It's that their mind is going, that fact doesn't match to what I know to be true. And it's not what I've been paid attention to enough. And it's not what I know. So therefore, I will delete it. And you don't have that happen, Rocky, in an environment where there is no threat. It's much less happening. But when you have an environment like we've had for the you know last number of years where there was a threat and people wondered what was going to happen, that threat layered on top of that makes that a common way that the unconscious mind handles any kind of data that, that counteracts what you believe to be true or what has been successful in the past. And how do you drive a business forward in this market, in this reality, without changing what you've done. I don't I don't know I don't know very many businesses that can do that right now, Rocky. So you've got to be able to find ways to see those new opportunities and accept that new data without it being a threat. And that's the hard part, especially for teams. I think, you know, executives will open their eyes, but I think for teams and how do you lead groups, especially groups that there's always, you know, there's always the the power leader that may or may not be obvious. And then there's everybody else that follows. How do you get all of those minds to open to the opportunities that are in front of them if they can simply change what they're paying attention to and start to pay attention to new data? And there's some ways to trick your mind to do that. And, and you know, we can talk about some of those, right? There's ways to get the mind to start to open and look differently at data simply by using techniques that then starts to have your mind go, Oh, okay. I can open up and see more of a 360 perspective. And that's what we all need right now. For me, I think that's where the power of coaching masterminds and outside people who are not part of your daily life is a real big help because they see things that are just, they see the elephants in the room that are right there that we are totally blind to. And that's where the power of help allows you to achieve success much faster. And without a lot of effort, because it's little changes that will allow you to skyrocket. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. So go ahead and share. So what are the things that we can do to pay attention to our attention and take more control? Right. Well, and I think I agree with you on the coaching, and but even with the best coaching and, and I, you know, you have I've, to listen. <laughs> I've consulted my whole life. That's my point. That's exactly where I was going. Even with the best coaching, if the client 
the company, the owner, whatever, doesn't change the way their mind pays attention, what it pays attention to and what they're focused on and what they expect, you can coach till you're blue in the face. It won't change. It'll change minorly, but it won't change in the in the way that it needs to because these programs are are strong and you have to literally know how to get your mind. And by the way, our habits are designed to reinforce the programs and what we pay attention to and what we know to be true, not to question them. Our habit, our habitual thinking is not questioning thinking. It's it's deductive, not inductive. Right. The way we've all been taught. So. So, you know, one of the things I'm going to I'm going to have you post with this with this podcast is a link to a short little white paper I have on my site that's called The Science of Paying Attention. And it goes through what we talked about today in a little more detail, but it also has six concrete steps that every business can start to use. And they're techniques. They're not steps. They're techniques that are ways that you change the way you look at things and think about things that will start to open up your mind to be able to see more opportunity, more innovation, and step out of that hunkered down, okay, this is where I'm safe and this is where I know and this is where I know is true and it's right and it's the way we've always done it, into new opportunities, new innovations, new ways of thinking, and being able to hear new ideas, see new ideas, experience new ideas, right? Because as long as we're in that old programming, we don't do that easily. So so let's talk about a couple of those, all right? So one of my favorite ones is... As as humans, we are innately programmed to believe that we are right. Okay. And by the way, some of the research, if you ever want, if you want, some of the research is pretty interesting. We believe we are right no matter what. Once we make a decision, we are right. And by the way, that design was there because you need a caveman to believe he's right and he's going to win to go out, get him to go out and face a woolly mammoth. Right. You got to believe you're right. But you, we believe we're right to the point that we don't, and that's part of that. We pay attention, we focus on what we believe and expect, and we believe that's right. So now I'm deleting all the data that would prove that it was wrong, right? I'm reinforcing the belief that I'm right, and that's really dangerous to me in a business because I don't care whether I'm right or wrong. I care what the customer thinks, right? <laughs> right? Well, so – That carries into a habit we have. So let's say we have a new idea or an an idea to expand or to change the business or to just whatever, right? We go out and we start doing research on that idea. So what do we do in that research? We go out and we look for things to prove ourselves right. We go look in the web and we find articles that prove what we believe is true, right? We find we listen to the customers that tell us our you know that repeat our our song to us the ones that are really and angry we just say oh they're just curmudgeons right we don't listen to them we are right so one of the things I, i have my clients do is to stop that instead every time you go to research a new idea go out with the idea that you're going to prove yourself wrong Look for things that prove that idea to be not good, to be wrong, to be untrue, to whatever. And, and here's why. A, it flips your brain because now your brain's looking for things and listening to things that are counter to what you believe. And guess what? That's where you get your ideas, right? That's where you really learn. But also, if you can't find anything to prove you're wrong, then you know you're right and charge ahead. You even no matter what you find, if you take a 360 perspective versus just trying to prove yourself right, you get a better result because you find more information, you take in more information, your mind's open to it, and do you think you end up with a better answer than you started with? You better believe it, right? You learn from those ways. You learn from everything you take in. So you get better, and by the way, worst case, you find out you're wrong, and you know what? You save yourself time, money, and a lot of headaches. So... And it's a simple flip, but we all, you know what, it's, I will tell you this, to go out and start to try to prove yourself wrong takes a lot of conscious attention because the knee-jerk reaction is to only listen to that which you believe to be true that agrees with you because that's how your brain's designed. 
And this is why we have such a trouble in politics, because none of them will listen to the other side. And even though when they're wrong, it doesn't matter. And we've created an absolute mess. <laughs> we've created a bifurcated because we've got we have literally created a really strong right on one side and right on the other. Right. And now what's happened is even the information that's taken in, you know, somebody looked at me the other day and said, my God, they can't even read what's right in front of them. And I'm like, you got to understand. Regardless of who they hey, is, hey, I don't really care one side or the other. David Richter, their brains have hey. locked into belief systems that anything that is, even if it's hard, fast data that is different than their belief, their freaking brain will delete it rather than process it unless they step in consciously and open to listening to it. It's a it's automatic function. So you can sit there until you're blue in the face arguing with somebody that's on that opposite side, but their brains have literally shifted. It's like the fans on a Super Bowl team and one makes a, the call goes one way, not the other, and they're at each other's throats. It's no different other than it's on a massive scale. So part of it's the filtering mechanism that happens based on what we know to be true is what we filter into our reality. And when anything that counters that, we will not accept. That's part of it. And the other part is this drive that I am right and I know I'm right and you're wrong. And by God, I will fight till, till hell freezes over. And then we've got the whole fear thing on top of it, which makes the brain operate in threat mode that escalates all of the response behaviors. That's what you're seeing on a mass scale in the United States right now. I never thought I'd see it. It's the perfect storm, Rocky. And the way to get out of it is to step back and realize that, yeah, I always think I, I think I'm right and I have a very limited perspective of my reality because that's how I've been trained. So now, what can I pay attention to? How can I shift my attention first so I'm focused on positive, not negative, and get rid of the grouse and when I'm unconscious? But B, what am I going to learn today? What am I going to go read today that counters everything I believe? so that I can expand. I do that a lot. I go and, you know, if I believe X is true, I'll go read about Y and Z just because I want to see, because you know what? Every time you do that, you may disagree with 95% of it, but there may be a grain in there, a little grain that you look at and go, that's brilliant. And you bring it over and that shifts your attention. It shifts your beliefs and expectations. That's how you start to bring in new ideas, new approaches, new innovations, and get yourself into a constantly changing dynamic approach and your attention starts to go to everything instead of just narrow and narrow and narrow and down. All right. Now, the other thing I tell people that goes along with this, we are, are, we are designed to be as efficient as we can in processing data because every, every nanosecond that we spend processing data takes away from our ability to watch the world around us for new threats coming. Okay. We got to watch and we don't want to spend all this time processing data. So your, your mind be, builds all these little templates, if you will, it short circuits the process. It finds repetitive patterns that it can implement as part of your processing, like the filtering, right? So when you look at data, you know, we all have our Excel spreadsheets, right? When you look at data, your, your mind starts to pattern that data. So if you look at a spreadsheet, the same spreadsheet every week, month in, month out, your mind will start to imprint what the data was on that spreadsheet. And it will start to not look at the actual data. It will only look for deltas that it sees as big enough to be important. It will only see the changes in that data that it believes are big enough to represent a threat or an opportunity. So now, and this is, this is I saw this in my clients for decades before I got into the mind science. I go in and I look at the numbers and I immediately see this slow change right? Slow trend in the wrong direction. But it wasn't a big step. It was a small step. But small, small steps over a year turn into an, oh my God, right? Where did that come from? Right? Your brain goes like 
How did we not see it? Well, their brain didn't show it to them until it got big enough. So that's another facet of this attention. So what I tell people to do is change the way you present the data. So if you have a spreadsheet that's a pipeline spreadsheet, stop looking at it as a spreadsheet. Look at it as a different kind of graph every time you look at it. Flip, reverse the columns. Turn it around. Turn it upside down. You know, and by the way, we all do it because anytime we're going to put a presentation together with numbers or with any kind of data, how often have you gone and looked at all the different graphing options till you found the one that presented it in the best way so that people could see what the point was, right? All the time. We do it that way, but then we rely on this repetitive data. Change the way your data is presented every time you look at it because all of a sudden, I can't tell you, I have had client after client that all of a sudden I'll have a CFO call me and go, oh, my God, I did what you said, and I just saw something that's been going on for two months that I never would attract if, you hadn't, if I hadn't done this, right? You're Basically what you're doing, Rocky, is you're playing tricks on your brain to, uh, to short-circuit the pattern that it's already created to make it think outside of the box, and then it reengages. And that's important. That's very, very important is to do that. And I know for the number side, especially on for businesses, is – to make it graphical, because you you can see a trend line that's going down for sales very, very easily. But if you've got a row of numbers, you may not see it at all. Well, and I'll give you an example. So let's say, oh, I can't be too specific because I have clients. You have a high ticket item that has a services line item that can be very high, depending on what you're doing and what you're installing. And that services line item starts to change and become 1% more of your cost of delivery every month. What happens to you in 12 months? 12%. Is that big enough to make you go, oh, my God? Mm -hmm. And that's where it plays. It's You'll see it in sales, but more so it's in dynamics within the spread, within our data, like costs. Um Manu you know, and a lot of discrete costs in manufacturing because they'll change and people, it's just a little bit. So nobody thinks it's a big deal, but a little bit times 10 or 12 or even five can turn into a big deal, especially in a business where you got a 4% margin to set 5% margin, right? Even 10%, 20%, 10 if you've got 1% change in your cost every month and over 12 months and you are only running on a 20% margin, you know when you're going to find that 1%? When it hits about five or six, that's when you're going to notice it. And by then, how far down the path are you? Very far. Yeah, too far. Too far. So that's why I, and, you know, so prove, just by proving yourself wrong, you open your mind. And by flipping the way you look at data, but by the way, you can flip the way you look at anything. And one of the ways I do it, like, uh, you know, like I'll do this exercise with companies because I do a lot of product strategy and positioning and product marketing and that kind of work for companies as well as corporate strategy. They'll I'll have somebody play what's called stump the chump. And I'm usually the chump, but I will take a ingrained belief of the company. Right. And I will sit up there and I will defend it and I will ask the people within the company to attack it and to prove that that belief is wrong. And I'll defend it. I won't let them defend it. I'll do it. And you know what? It's amazing what they come up with because they're not in, the skin is in the game for them to attack it, not protect it. And once they start questioning it, and I don't say attacking, I say ask questions about it. And it's funny because they'll start to ask me questions and the human dynamic kicks in and they start to really get into the questions to see who can come up with the coolest question, right? Especially to, I hate to say this, but to stump the girl consultant, right? And it's funny because all of a sudden it never fails. Somewhere in the middle of the question, somebody will start laughing and, 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 and look at everybody and go, listen to us. We're proving her point for her. But that's not true. That's, a, you know, question the re question. You pay attention. It creates a belief and it becomes an expectation that that's the way the world is. Why? Why do you believe that? Why do you think that's true? Where is the evidence of that in today, right now? 
what else could be true? What is the opposite of that that could be true? And when you start asking those questions, you know, questions open your mind to new data. Statements narrow your mind to just that data of the statement. So you always want to use questions rather than statements. But if you think about it, now I'm starting to prove myself wrong on, on beliefs and research. I'm starting to have teams that don't just go, oh, that's a really great idea. Question it. You know, oh, this is the way we've always done it. Why? Why does it have to be that way? What else could it be? You know, brainstorming how to do things better. And you're changing your data up so your inputs actually come in differently so you see more. Is that not a recipe for being able to get out of your own way? Very much so. And so I, I think you're correct. We, we have to look at things from different viewpoints. And it's not something we like to do because we don't want to say we're wrong. Well, and our attention is designed. We're literally designed to pay attention to threats. We're designed to pay attention to unknowns, to potential un things that could attack us. And we're designed to pay attention to what makes us comfortable. That's, I mean, we are so much of our mind is on autopilot when it comes to the data. You know, our mind is a search engine. We have this bunch of data that comes in and we search it and filter it just like Google does to find what matches our expectation, right? You know what's funny? If you look at a, a Google result, so if you search a term, 80% of people will literally click on the first result. Barely 20% will click on the second result, and you get down to, like, hardly anybody getting to the third result and forget about anything from there. People just do the first thing. And by the way, your brain works the same way. It filters that data, so it says, let's say, I'll give you my example. Having a broad, deep career is a problem. It's not a, a good thing. It's a bad thing because everybody expects executives to have a silo, right? How silly is that, Rocky, by the way? How silly is that belief? But so I have that belief. So that means that any idea or any data or anything that would come into my mind, I would search it. And if it would show me, hey, you know what? Here's somebody that's promoting themselves that's done really well and they have a career like yours. I would never see that data because it wouldn't click on that. It would throw it away. It would be the hundredth return in my Google search. What would be the first return in my Google search would be an article, would be every belief I have or every article or everything I know that would tell me why it's a bad idea, because that's what I already believe. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> and we're designed that way. For and, and by the way, modern world was not what the designers <laughs> expected back in the day. Right. And they sure didn't expect today with with, I mean, a perfect storm of nothing but fear triggering experiences all around us. And in an environment where we're already oversaturated with threatening things, right? I mean, just read the news. I mean, you can't read a paragraph of the news and not find three threats. I don't care who you read as news, right? Which is a reason not to pay attention to the news, right? But we are. And once you learn, you know, once you learn how to pay attention to what you're paying attention to, and then shift that, right? I'm paying attention to hanging on to the way I've always done it. What's one thing I can do today that's different? What can I research today that is totally abstract? If you start doing that and shifting your attention to be broader and more expansive and away from what you've always done, everything else starts to follow. Because once you start to do that, your unconscious mind says, oh, that's what she wants. So I'll do more of that. It's following you in real time, but you got these built up all these years of built up stuff that you've got to kind of get past. So you've got to stay conscious about it. Even when you're unconsciously grousing while you're doing dishes, you got to catch yourself, laugh and go, you know what? That's really not true. What I really want to focus on is this, but it works. It works. I mean, you start to focus on new things. And like you said, the clients, the companies that have, said, wait a minute, I'm not going to focus on the problem. I'm going to focus on what new solutions I can come up with. I'm not going to listen to, oh, my God, we're going to die. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose my business. Oh, my God, I'm going to be home. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to focus on what's out there that needs to happen, who's out there that I can serve, and how can I serve them and help them. Those are the companies that have flipped where their attention is, and it's changed their business and their world. 
And that's what we all can do. We just have to consciously do. We have to consciously be. Un, we have to consciously monitor our unconscious and our conscious, and pay attention to our attention. And that makes total, total sense. Based on our conversation today in this topic, what is one action step people can take this week to bring about change in their lives? Um, I think in let, let's do it from a business perspective, Rocky. Pay attention to the knowns that you hold dear, to the way you've always done it, the status quo. I do this and this is what my business is. I always do it this way. I want I, this is truth. This, you know, whatever it is and start to ask yourself questions. Ask yourself why. Why do I believe that? Where is the proof of that? Is that still true? What other truths are around that? Start to question those things that you pay attention to as knowns and beliefs and expectations, because that's the beginning of that. And, and then ask the questions to prove yourself wrong, right? To prove that there is an expanded version of your truth, because that begins to open your mind to be able to see and accept more of the data and not be such so strict about filtering just for the way you've always thought about it. And I think that is great advice. Right. And, and, you know, one of the things I do with every client I have is I always do a session. You know, I, I do a lot of strategy work. So we'll have 20 people in a room working on a strategy for the company. And every time they tell me, for example, they'll say, well, we succeed in this market and we do really well in this market, blah, blah, blah. And I'll look at them and say, why do you know that's true? And they'll look at me and go, well, we do. And I'll say, where's the evidence? Oh, well, you know, we, it's our largest market. And I'm, I'll look at them and go, and how much does your competitor own in that market? And you know what? 90% of the time, the competitor is bigger in that market than they are, but they don't know it. They have assumed because it's their biggest market that they were winning. And in fact, it was low margin, hard to kept fight, win business, and not the greatest market, but they figured out how to win, even if it wasn't the best opportunity. Right? That's the things you find when you start questioning those things that you've paid attention to to create the expectations and knowns that become the foundation of your business. And I'm sorry, 25, 30 years ago when I started consulting, a business could say, this is who I am. And three to five years later, it was probably a similar business. That is not true anymore. What the business was six months ago may or may not be valid now. So... Everything you have ingrained in you is from you've paid attention to to know it's true. You've got to question every bit of that and you've got to get your mind in a position to know that you're questioning it and to go look at other options. Seek out more data. The more data you get through into your mind without it being blocked, the better opportunities you have for thinking out of the box and innovation. And that is going to be the difference between those who survive and thrive and those who disappear. You've got to constantly innovate right. and constantly change. And, and here's the other thing, Rocky. There is a, I believe that there is a mass belief that's been entrenched in entrepreneurs that change is hard, that innovation is hard, and that is a crock. That is a total crock. Innovation is so simple. We fight it because it's change. Innov and change is a threat, and our minds are programmed to fight against that. Innovation is easy because anytime you're moving to solve a problem for a customer or a client or whatever, it's easy to move that way. It may disrupt a lot of people and ruffle feathers and people may get upset and grouse and moan, but that's a human response. That is not a business fact. And I read a book. It was called uh, Disrupt You. It's by Jay Samet. And huh? Jay actually was in a lot of industries that are no longer around because he disrupted them all right? by constantly challenging everyone. And that's what he fought against was people who wouldn't um, change and couldn't see the opportunity. And he was a master at helping them see change. Well, and you know, that's what, if you talk to my venture guys, that's what they tell you. I see the things that other people don't see. I walk in and see them and I, and they used to, th you know, I know now why I have a lot of experience I don't see very many things I haven't seen before by this point in my career, but I don't have any of the blinders, the blind spots, the filters 
that, that, that the people in the business have about who and what they are and what they do. I walk in with a clean whiteboard going, where's the opportunity? What's cool here? What do I go hmm about, right? You don't do that. They have it already imprinted as their storyline because that's what they've focused on and their attention and that's the expectation. Once you get to the point you can see beyond that and you can literally see what's going on and not be locked into the way you've always done it, people in the bit, once I get, once we get past that and I start throwing ideas, it's amazing what happens in a room because I'll be on a whiteboard throwing up ideas and people will start to fight me and then all of a sudden somebody will come along and start to add to it and somebody else and the ideas that come out are so much more powerful than anything I would come up with because they know their business. But they just need the structure to hang it on rather than what is ingrained in their brains. We may be smart, but we're also designed to repeat, 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 because repetition in a comfort zone is a lot safer than going out into the unknown with something new. And yet the unknown and something new is where you win in business, right? And that is very true. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Gratitude. You know, it's funny, like practically everyone is saying that these days, <laughs> and it's probably because it's true. I have, Rocky, I have probably 30 years of journals of every morning and every night. I write my 10 things I'm grateful for. I've done it for 30 years since I started my first business 30 years ago. That's impressive. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it, the days I don't do it, I don't feel right. Hmm. I, I, I feel, but it is. And I'll even, I was talking to, I, I was working with a client yesterday doing some mind shifting and I was talking to her and I said, every step you take, do a hundred steps of gratitude. Focus because we removed, you know, we released a lot of limiting programming and, and some programming she had from childhood that was from abuse. And, you know, there's all this space in her mind now. And I was like, the best way you can fill that space is with gratitude because it puts you in a position of when you're thankful for things around you and you're noticing the little details, your unconscious mind goes into a different mode than when it's threatened. And that again starts to open up what you see in your world. If you're afraid and clenched down, it's a totally different world than if you're grateful and standing up and confident. That is so true. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? <laughs> that, I don't, that what other people think doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't, right? They don't care about you anyway, so why listen to them? <laughs> because, I was, because I was an abused, tortured child, I was trained that I had to be perfect and everybody had to agree I was perfect or else I was going to get abused. Oh, I'll tell you what, that really played. Ha it, there were things about it that made me really good in business because you know what? I had to be perfect or I was going to get beat up. So I was perfect and I drove for perfection, drove a lot of people crazy doing it. Um, but, you know, but it also made me every single thing that everybody said. I had to be perfect in their eyes or I was in, in danger of death. It was that kind of a program. You know how much energy that was and how much wasted. Oh, my God. Angst. And now I realize you know what? Everybody has their opinion. No two of us live in the same reality because no two of us are picking that same 127 bits every second. Let me tell you, not happening. So everybody's got an opinion and they have a right to it. But that doesn't mean it means that what their opinion of is me is really the truth. I have my truth and I am the keeper of it. And I'm the only one that really knows it. And that's awesome. If you were to give an 18 year old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Oh, an 18 year old. Enjoy, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy college, enjoy your life, enjoy what you're learning and be ready because it's going to change. Enjoy it. Now, I would tell an 18 year old to enjoy it now. <laughs> Just like your mother did and your mother probably did too, right? Enjoy it now because it's going to get, you're going to have responsibilities. Everyone told me that and all I wanted to be was 28 now, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, enjoy it. It's the last time you'll ever it's the last time you'll actually have the ability to not have to be responsible about anything other than learning and college. And that is a blessing. And that's what I'd tell them. 
And that it is. If people would like to find you, connect, and learn more, where should they do that? Rebelbrown.com makes it really easy. And it's Rebel Brown on LinkedIn. It's Rebel Brown. It's Rebel Brown on Facebook. YouTube is Revelations TV, but you can also find it through Rebel Brown. And all of it's on my website. Cool. And we will put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Rocky, you are an amazing man and you do so much for so many. Thank you. I always enjoy conversations with Rebel. The bottom line is we need to question everything. What is it that you need to question? The first thing is me. Don't believe everything I say. Challenge what I say. Is it true? Challenge your beliefs, especially your money story. This week's action step is just that. Pay attention to what you believe to be true and ask why. I'm working on this in my life and I know I need to do a better job. I have trouble with focus and attention. I live in my own world. I need to be mindful and present and challenge myself because I am my worst enemy. Next week, we have on Dr. Paul Knapper on the power of agency, which is to question who's in charge of your life and to take charge so that you can lead yourself. What's preventing you from moving forward and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Remember how Rebel talked about how she helps people see the next step they can't see because they're stuck? That's what I do for my clients. I help them see the gold sitting on the ground in front of them. Are you ready to pick it up? Use the scheduling link in the show notes. It's a free call and you can make a massive shift in your outcomes. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.